Hello and welcome to the St. Louis Online. I'm Pete Smith, co-chairman of the 40th National Narrow Gauge Convention Planning Committee. The video you are about to watch is part of a series of clinics and layout tours presented as a virtual but slimmed down version of our narrow gauge convention, which had to be canceled due to the coronavirus. We thank all of our presenters for their support and for allowing us to share their work with you. Our thanks also to Russ Segner, Robin Peel, and Burr Stewart for producing this series. For more information on this video and others, go to our website at 40ngc.com. We hope you enjoy the program that follows. Our next presenter is uh, uh, Guy Cantwell. Cantwell is going to talk to us about scenery and scenery techniques. Here we are. My name is Guy Cantwell. I'd like to thank you all for uh, showing up to check out the clinic today. I also want to thank the uh, Narrow Gauge uh, Convention for inviting me to do this clinic. Um, I'm basically modeling a uh, standard gauge double deck layout, uh, HO scale. It's titled the Willoughby Line. It's a proto lance layout in a 13 by 22 space. It's West Coast scenery. It's been about a 15 year project up to this point. Uh, the clinic is based off a lot of photos of the layout, and we have a West Coast skew because of what I'm modeling. Uh, if you want to save the questions till the end, or if you want to look me up later on online, you can do that and ask questions. Um, so we're going to look at scenery tips and techniques, ideas to improve your scenery. Um, a couple of the clinic topics, I thought I'd break it up into a couple different things here. One of them would be uh, design ideas that you do actually before you do any scenery, looking at track plan and bench work design and how you can optimize that for your scenery later. And then the basic elements that most people consider to be scenery, which would include landforms, ground cover, and trees. Some ideas about how to work with that stuff and then some tips and techniques. Uh, anything you hear me talk about in the clinic, you'll find somebody else doing it exactly the opposite way and doing it really well. Uh, so this is just um, one approach to things. Um, so looking at basic ideas for, you know, going all the way back to the basic concept of your railroad, um, looking at the track plan and uh, trying to figure out how to make it uh, more scenery friendly. And Dean did a great job of uh, uh, describing a few things that he went through to, in order to get to that spot. One of the things I would say is that the choice of uh, minimum radius often drives a lot of stuff in track planning. And uh, how to fit that in, your switch sizes, your grades, your rail codes, all this will make a difference later on. Uh, choosing a location, even if you're doing a freelance railroad, uh, will help drive all of your scenery choices. Um, designating some scenes, I broke my railroad up into about 12 different scenes and, uh, and then considering the train path through those scenes, I flipped a couple things to make more logical sense. Uh, I'll assume that you've created a basic track plan and then the one below there, checking your appetite, um, be realistic about what will fit um, and when in doubt, leave it out. If you leave stuff out, you can always add it in later, uh, but if you box things in with a lot of track, it's often hard later to make the scenery more realistic. Um, track plan concepts, looking at real quick here, is the uh, watching the curves, and we'll talk about how the curves drive a lot of things, avoiding the overcrowding, and then curve radius and grades, a little bit about some track standards. Um, so first off, talking about track placement and how curves uh, can, can deal with that a little bit, here's my minimum 30-inch radius curve coming into the scene. The scene is about 2 feet wide here and about 13 feet long. And originally, I had the track placed right down the middle of the scene, leaving me not a lot of room on either side for a big scene. But by pushing the curve much further into the scene, it gave me more room in the front to create a bigger scene. Still left me enough room back there to convincingly scenic it. Here's what that scene ended up like. And I had a little more room to make a space for this particular structure here. Um, here we're at the other end of that same peninsula, or scene, excuse me, and you notice that the, the curve is now at the front of the, of the scene, and it gives us plenty of room in the back to make a scene there, which we end up with that particular look. Um, here's another example of curves driving the track plan and the scenery a little bit. You notice that I started the curve here in order to get us fairly close to the fascia and then have the, tr the scene move away from you in that spot, giving us plenty of room in the back to create some scenery. And over here, as the diagonal moves away from you, you get room in the front to have a scene as well. Okay, this one is talking about how uh, trying to not overcrowd your track plan. I drew my plan out on paper, and uh, the thin lines look like you can get a lot of track in there. But when I started laying stuff out on the bench work, I noticed that it looked a lot more crowded. So the process was kind of taking track out. Here's an example of that. Uh, this is as it was drawn. And this is as it ended up, uh, much spare, more sparse. I'm going to pull a little siding off of there. And this gives more of a rural feel. 
and that's the scene more completed, something for you heavy metal fans there. And then here's another example of a lot of track. This is the yard as drawn. Notice I'm using triple slips, which don't exactly, when you put them down actually in front of you and look at them, they don't really look very rustic or rural, which is what I was shooting for. And these six tracks with train cars on them begin to look like a parking lot. So this is the uh, reduction of that. You notice that we've cut down on the number of tracks here. It's also a good example of how the curves can drive things. You notice that this is the outside edge of my peninsula, so that's where the curve had to be in order to fit. And over here, the diameter here is very big, and so it ends up getting shoved up against the wall. But I chose to push it all the way to the back of the wall here so I could have room in front to put some scenery in. You also notice that by cutting down the tracks here, we got more room for scenery along the back. And this is how the scene ended up looking finished. And there's room for the roundhouse and some other things in front of that curve. Talking about radius here for a second, this is an example of what you can do. This is almost a parlor trick, if you will. This is a 14-inch radius in an old Markland layout. Train goes in here and comes out there. Now, it's good for certain things, uh, sort of fooling people, but maybe not looking too realistic. Um, and here is the, uh, uh, the um, talking about grades here, uh, steep grades versus not quite so steep grades. This particular is a 6% grade here, and one of the things that you find with grades when you do that is that if they're really steep, you don't want to have something level nearby that you can judge the grade by. Also, another problem with really steep grades is if you put a building right next to the grade here, either the building has, to, has the grade fall away from it, which looks a bit unrealistic, or the building will have to be parallel to the grade, which will <coughs> also look bad. Talking about track size and quality, just a real quick look through here. Uh, so this is Code 100 Atlas track, and I'm using this in staging where it can't do any harm. But the visible track, I wanted it to have, look a little better. And this is showing the different codes. This is Code 83, Code 70, and Code uh, 55 in HO scale. Uh, and you can notice that the track detail is much finer. And when you get to the final scene, this is Code 70 and Code 55. And you could argue that, well, Code 100 little looked okay here, but I think you would also uh, agree that the Code 70 and 55 look a little better. Talking about elevations and view angles a little bit, about benchwork design mainly, um, sight lines are real important here, whether you're looking at the scene directly in at your eye level or whether you're looking down on the scene. Uh, planning the elevations within the scene relative to that, you know, making things at different levels, and then trying to create view blocks to sort of frame the scene a little bit and direct the viewer's attention to things that you want them to see and away from stuff that you don't want them to see. Um, so here's an example of getting scenery above and below the track. Uh, the face is down here. We've got the track in the middle. Um, here's another example of that with upper deck supports on the railroad. Um, it's fairly thick here for the lights and the uh, switch machines that you can't really see there. And then it fades away to the viewer. And this is what the scene ended up looking like with the track level here and the scenery coming down to you. Um, here's another example. This one's more about sight lines. And uh, when you have a scene that you're looking at at eye level, you can easily block the view by having stuff right in front. So in order to make things a little more visible, I lowered this track down about three quarters of an inch so it's easier to see in. And the scene kind of ascends away from you. And then over here, I raise the track up about three quarters of an inch so that you can see it over the other track. This is what that view looks like. Here's the higher track in the background, the low track, and you're looking in the scene this way. And this is a, an example of view blocks. And the idea here is that we want to try, once again at eye level, we want to try and hide this track that's going to run into the wall. We want it to appear like it disappears. Uh, and so we're going to see how we can do a view block right there. And this is what it ended up looking like. You notice I didn't have to do a lot in order to do that. It's not super high here because it's at eye level. Uh, we don't see the track at all. There we are to the left. Still don't really see it. It's only until you get up on the layout there that you begin to see the track that it actually just runs into the wall. This isn't even finished on the back side. The view would be from this side in. This is another example of viewing at eye level. Um, in this particular instance, I wanted to think about what my view is going to be in the scene looking this way. And then also, I super detailed this building because you'd be able to look in right at eye level and look at things. It's got a full interior with lighting in it. This is what the finished scene looked like viewing down the scene. And then this is detail on the turntable, which is right at your eye level, so it's, it's visible right in your face. And there is the engine house. Uh, full detail is not visible because I uh, don't have the engine lights on for this shot.
Okay, so those are some things that you might consider before you actually start doing any scenery. Now to talk about what most people consider to be scenery. Um, I will say that I think this is the golden age of scenery products. If you look in the Scenic Express catalog in the last 20 years, this stuff has just gone crazy. There's a lot of really great products out there that just didn't exist 25 years ago. Um, scenery can be imperfect. Uh, you know, even uh, a mediocre effort will look better than none. You can always go back and fix it, and if you practice it, it does get a lot better. <clears throat> Some overall principles, these would be sort of things that we would apply as you're doing your scenery going through the layout uh, and, you know, application of them evenly across the whole um, spectrum will improve the scenery uh, of real the realism of your layout. Um, using fine detail, <clears throat> um, no cheese ball. That idea would be that anything that is, you know, marginally realistic, those freakishly green trees, that truck that's bright orange, uh, get rid of them and be ruthless about that. Uh, subdue the colors. Uh, we don't have super bright light uh, under the layout, so uh, little subdued colors work a little better. Try and make things as straight and true as possible. I'll actually use a, a level to make sure my buildings are level on the layout. And as far as the edges of loading docks and, and fences, when you take, uh, you know, rough and uneven stuff and scale it down, it looks almost perfect in the smaller scales. So make it pretty clean and then uh, try and use weathering and other things to give it that beat up look. And speaking of weathering, try and keep it as even as you can, make it consistent. So some of the scenic elements we're going to run through here. Uh, uh, main thing would be these five here, landforms, rocks, dirt, grass, and trees. Um, and by choosing a location and trying to codify all that together, even if you're looking at a uh, freelance railroad, it will improve the realism of all these things. And we'll kind of tell you what to do in terms of the types of trees and the rocks that you might find in the particular area, how to color them, uh, what kind of rocks they might be. So we're going to talk on a few of these elements real quick. I'm just going to fly through here and talk about a little bit of each of these. Um, so landforms, the idea here would be probably the biggest tip I can give you here is uh, plan for the drainage, the roads, and the structures. Make things, a little, not everything, completely flat. Um, and uh, if you're going to, we'll assume you've got the hard shell down, so you're now kind of going in and roughing in before we put all the materials down for the final scenery. So uh, in order to uh, sculpt all that stuff, I recommend using a slow set plaster like Durban 90 or Structure to light. Gives you plenty of time to work and build up the roads, create the surfaces and the drainage. If you're using screen, which is old school, I happen to use screen, avoid the screen shape. Screen kind of flops in funny ways and creates sort of unrealistic curves. You want to attack it with scissors and hot glue to whip it into shape and get rid of that stuff. Um, here's some examples of some landform. This is about a gallon of uh, light spackle. Uh, fill in the, the uh, road surface here and the drainage around it. Here's another example using Structolite. This is sort of after the dirt has been put down, obviously. Um, but I had plenty of time to work on this and smooth it out. Another example of Structolite and drainage around it. So we'll assume you're going to want to do some rocks here. Uh, so we got, uh, I, I sort of break these into two categories, either hand carved or molds. Um, hand carving is really great for broken rock cliffs, exfoliated stuff. Uh, it's also very therapeutic to hack it, plaster, something about that. Uh, molds, I pretty much use those for everything else. Um, we'll talk a little bit about how to color rocks and about uh, the loose rock. Um, so working with plaster, first of all, I'm a huge plaster fan. Um, so I recommend uh, buying hydrocol or casting plaster and use those for your rock work because it's a lot stronger. You can buy these in bulk at the plaster and lath store. There's usually one of these stores in every town that caters to, to uh, carpenters and uh, contractors actually repairing uh, walls of houses built in the 1920s and 30s with plaster. You can find it much cheaper there than you can in other places. Plaster soaks up water and degrades over time. So if the plaster is not getting hot when you, when you mix it up, get rid of it and get some new stuff. Don't ever store a plaster bag on a cement floor. It'll soak up water through the floor and ruin it pretty quickly. Uh, measure the mix as precisely as you can and then use the same mix each time, uh, the ratio I should say. Um, and then taming the mess, uh, plaster will make a huge mess. I have uh, plaster soaked shoes and pants and jackets and stuff. It all stays in the train room. I try and contain it as much as possible. But one tip I have for you here is to use two five gallon bucket, buckets full of water. The first bucket gets uh, all the big crap off your hands as you wash it down as much as you possibly can. And then you go to the second bucket and clean it up a bit. And by the time you're done with the second bucket, you should be able to open a doorknob without turning it white. Uh, and this will make you much more popular with the family when you're doing this stuff. Don't ask me how I know that, by the way. Um, so talking about hand carving real quick here, just a couple tips. 
Um, if you're going to hand carve, uh, let the plaster set to the yogurt stage um, in the mixing bowl and then slap it on the uh, hard shell that you've pre-wetted. You have about 10 minutes or so to get your carving done before it'll turn to stone. Um, and basically, I like to use a uh, utility knife to go horizontal on it and then a chisel to chip out the rocks in between to give it that broken rock look. Uh, here's a canyon that was done using that method. Took a couple of years of carving off and on. Here's a rock wall that kind of before it's been colored and you can see there's the horizontal lines and then they've been hit with a chisel to break the rock up and give it that look. Here's that rock wall finished. Rock molds, um, just a couple things to say about molds. Um, one is you don't need as many as you think you do. The scene that you're looking at here in the little picture is about six molds that have been flipped back and forth and uh, rearranged to, to try and make them look, disguise the fact that it's the same mold over and over again. Uh, mold filling, you want to fill that up with thick plaster, let it almost harden up, get to the yogurt stage again, slap it on your hard shell, leave it there till it gets warm and then peel it off. And then the other piece of advice I have here is clean it immediately. Uh, if you let the plaster completely set up in the mold, you pretty much ruin it. It'll be hard to get it out later. Um, here's a uh, wall with some molds and uh, the same mold has been used in that wall more than once. Another example with the same mold has been repeated a couple times in there. Uh, so coloring rocks, just a couple of things to say here, you know, obviously you're going to choose your color palette of, according to what kind of rocks you're modeling. Uh, I use a leopard spot technique where you just daub little bits of color in various places and then you tie it together with a black wash. That's pretty standard fare. Uh, one suggestion I have for you is to make sure that the light source that you're using on the layout, decide on a color temperature that you're going to use for the whole layout make your scenery consistent under that color temperature. Whenever you do any coloring of anything, make sure you're using the layout light so you're going to view the scene under to do the, uh, the coloring of the rock. And the other thing is to watch the intensity of the colors. If you get things too dark, it's very hard to lighten them later. Uh, so here's that same wall. Here it is with the leopard spots on it. We're partway there. And there it is with the leopard spots and the black wash completed. There's the other scene of the wash going through. There we have it with some leopard spots on it. And there it is with the dark wash and the rest of the scenery complete. Here's another example. This is exfoliated granite. In this case, I went much darker on the coloring because the lighter stuff just didn't look right. There's another view. I think I pretty much blown it here until I ended up in that spot and it ended up looking okay. Okay, and here's an example of, of the photo issues. You may have looked at the bottom of that first slide and seen that there. This is a very dark locomotive in front, properly exposed. And in doing that, we ended up burning out the back here um, with the lighting. So if you're going to take pictures in front of lighter stuff, you'll want to make some accommodations with your lighting to make sure that that doesn't happen. Talus and loose rock, basically just sift what you got. If you're cutting, carving plaster, you'll end up with a lot of extra plaster shavings, and you can uh, uh, sift those through and use them. Uh, there's an example of sifted stone in there that's been colored. And then here's real rock, uh, sift and, and use that. My daughter, the geologist, points out those should be broken up in order to be more realistic. But. So ground cover, big fan of using uh, natural stuff for this, the dirt, the debris, the loose rocks. And I like static grass for grass. There's lots of techniques here. We'll run through a few of them real quick. For dirt, um, it's near and dear to most of our hearts as uh, you know, narrow gauges or, or people who tend to be narrow-minded such as myself. Um, in this particular case, you want to find uh, the right shade of the dirt is probably the most important thing. I like to use real dirt. You can collect that from a variety of places. And you want to sift it out. The final sift should be a powder. And we'll talk a little bit about applying it. Here we're in the sifting process. There's my fine powder. Uh, there's some screens that I use to get to this stage, and then I save all the intermediary uh, sizes and use them later for scenery on the layout as well as the fine stuff. So the technique here, the biggest issue with dirt is that when you put glue it down, it darkens. Um, so you get your original shade, and then you want to find a lighter color of dirt to mix with it and keep mixing the lighter color in and keep testing it by gluing it down until you get the shade that you want when it's glued down. So the, the lighter color that you uh, glue down is going to be quite a bit lighter than your final color after the glue is set. Uh, generally, it's in three applications, a basic fill and then a couple of fine coats to fill those things in. And if you're looking for a dusty texture, there's a variety of ways to do that. I use sandpaper sometimes. Uh, you can sift the fine uh, dirt into a glue top coat uh, that you've laid over the final texture and then vacuum that off. Or you can use weathering powders, any combination of those. Here's the rough coat. Uh, this looks pretty bad, you know. Um, but once you hit it with glue, the volume reduces quite a bit and it ends up looking something like that. 
Uh, here we have the first coat of the final, fine stuff on it. It looks pretty good. There's a few holes to fill in. There's what the scene ended up looking like with the dirt complete. Here's sandpaper on. I use 100 grit or so. You can raise some pretty good dust that way. Uh, here's the look of sanded, and I put Bragdon weathering powders in between the rails to give it a little more of a greasy, sort of rusty look. Um, now we'll talk a little bit about grass. Um, if you're modeling California, certainly the golden grass is kind of a signature feature. I'm pretty frustrated early on in the hobby with sawdust and foam, which looked great at a distance, but not so good up close. And then there was horsehair sold by Woodland Scenics, but that stuff took forever. Static grass, in my opinion, has pretty made, much made those techniques a little bit obsolete. We'll talk about that here. Um, first of all, a trip down memory lane. This is the old horsehair stuff by Woodland Scenics. It looks okay, but it took about three hours to do this tiny little patch. This is other stuff from my yard that I was trying out. Uh, it all failed the time test. So I bought a static uh, grass gun, or actually built one from parts I found online. These are readily available now. I recommend you get one that plugs in so you don't have to mess with batteries. So just a couple of tips on application. Um, this is the area that we're going to static grass here real quick. The main tip I can throw at you here is the idea that you want to mask stuff. If your grass gun is, any, is powerful enough, it'll pick the static grass up out of the glue and move it around. And so you, now you have pieces of, of grass with glue on them sticking to everything. So mask it off. There you can see there's some you know, extra grass floating around there. And that's the scene after it's been uh, cleaned up and trimmed a bit. Um, so talking about different kinds of static grass to use, this palette is slanted towards California colors. You see all those parched and arid grass, this kind of stuff. Uh, use different heights um, on the colors. Make sure you watch out for the really vivid greens and the really vivid oranges. I would avoid those. Uh, Silflor was sort of the standard brand for quite a while, um, along with Nook. And then Woodland Scenics jumped in here about two years ago and greatly expanded their grass line with the different heights of grass and some very nice stuff. Also, don't forget the military modelers and the war gamers, the GeForce 9, a variety of other brands. Uh, when talking about grass, one of the things you always want to mix colors when you put it down. If you put all one color down, you're going to end up with something that looks like a carpet or a doormat. Uh, in this particular case, this was my basic color here, and then I mixed darker colors in with it. And if I wanted to show grass that hadn't dried out yet, I kept mixing a percentage of green in with that. And that gave us some different examples. There's sort of a dry with a little bit of water in it. And there's dry with hardly any water in it. There's very, very dry. And that has a combination of the two and the six millimeter grass together. Uh, here's a combination of two, four, and six millimeter grass using the Woodland Scenics and the Pico and the Sill Floor together. Um, here's an example of something I wanted to do at a higher elevation where the grass is a little greener. Uh, that's the rough before it's been vacuumed. Here's the finish scene. And in order to thin it out a little bit, I used a uh, uh, electric razor and use the beard trimmer from the razor to sort of knock back the thickness of the grass and the height. Uh, there's another example of pretty arid grass. Debris. Uh, once again, a big fan of using uh, natural elements here. Pine needles and leaves and bark. I actually grind up real pine needles and real dry leaves. Use a blender you get at the second hand store to keep uh, you know internal peace in the family. Uh, for small branches, uh, that's a bit tricky. Um, I like to look at stuff in the yard. Uh, sagebrush, dander, and pieces that come off of sagebrush works pretty good. Nandina, various other things. For logs and down wood, uh, to represent trees that have fallen over, I like rotten sticks. Just got to make sure the texture is right. And then I actually like uh, real rocks for uh, small rocks. So here's some examples. This is um, ground up pine needles and a little bit of ground up leaves there uh, next to the train car. Uh, here we have a, a rotten stick posing as a down tree. Um, here we have ground up pine needles, hopefully posing as pine needles. Here behind the uh, wagon, we've got some branches from uh, uh, sagebrush, and we have ground up pine needles and ground up leaves. There's another shot of that scene with some rocks in it. And this is a sort of combination of all of those elements with uh, probably a little more rocks in it. So for loose rocks, you can also use real rocks for this. Um, the biggest thing here is finding the fine texture and grain. Make sure the texture is very, very fine so that it looks in scale. Uh, and the shapes, you want to make sure you don't have any weird looking shapes or broken things. Um, coloring, you want to get close on that. There are some ways to color, but you don't want to spend a lot of time doing that. Um, here's an example of some of the different kinds of rocks that I might be using on the layout to scenic at any one time. I've also got all my glue dispensers there. It's probably pretty standard fare for most of you guys. Here's an example of an area we're going to put some rocks in. 
Uh, there's with some and some wood. There's with some finer grades of rocks and a little more wood. And there's the scene finished. And here's another example of a scene using a variety of rocks and natural um, uh, stuff here. And then coloring rocks, one of the things you notice in the Sierras and other places is that some rocks get kind of a sunburned look. And I found that putting Bragdon powder on top of the rocks and then pulling it down off the edge gives it a nice kind of sunburned boulder look, such as that. These are on small pumice stones. And there's another example. So now it gets us to trees, uh, one of my favorite subjects in model railroading. And uh, the old money time quality triangle sort of plays pretty heavily in this particular area of modeling. Uh, most of us don't have enough money to, to buy the several hundred or thousand trees you may need for a large layout. So we're looking to try and build things relatively quickly that look pretty good. Uh, one of the things you want to think about here is how many foreground trees do you need versus background? Because if you're going background, they can be made a little quicker and, and uh, a little less uh, time consuming, if you will. Uh, size and color, the prototype is generally bigger than you think it is, and we'll talk about some installation. Uh, first off, here is the old classic trees from the 1970s and 80s. This was state of the art. Armature is uh, plastic and is covered with foam. Super trees pretty much changed the game in the, what, mid to late 90s, somewhere in there. Um, much more finely detailed, and they're pretty quick. Uh, here's another example for you of a different type. These are furnace filter trees. These are more background trees. And there's some large furnace filter trees. And the basic idea here is you take the trunk as a skewer and you um, lay on layers of uh, crushed, there are basically crushed um, coconut husks that are sold in big mats at Walmart. And you cut them into star shapes and glue them on and then trim them up. So the tree types available to you as a modeler, you can buy stuff. Uh, Woodland Scenic still sells things. There's a lot of, a lot of products out there. You can get super trees, um, which I strongly recommend. You can use sagebrush uh, armatures um, uh, for larger trees and then furnace filter for some really tall trees and also for some smaller uh, pine trees. And then super detail, we'll talk about that for just a second. So first of all, most of you dealt with super trees, but I thought I'd run through it real quick. My recommendation here now, they've changed the way they price things at uh, Scenic Express. So go for the expensive, the $130 pack, and this is what you see on the left there. That's what you get. They're basically giant tumbleweeds, and you're going to pull them apart into tree armatures and pull the dry leaves off with tweezers, paint them with black, gray, or dark brown spray paint. And then you're going to put glue on them and apply foliage. I happen to like the Noak leaves a lot. There's a variety of ways you can do that. And I use crazy glue to install them. They do get bent, and I've boiled the armatures and done a bunch of stuff to try and get rid of the bend. It's really hard to get rid of it. Uh, so I just try and install them so you don't see it as much. Uh, here is your <laughs> tumbleweed. <clears throat> there is what that uh, batch of trees made in terms of the number of armatures. That's a fair number of trees. There's the different types of flocks that I use. You can see there's a variety of different products there, all of which work well. Uh, there's a batch that's out to dry. That'll sit there for about a day, hanging upside down. I'll spray them a couple times with glue to make sure the foliage is stuck on well. And there's most of what that batch made. That's about three quarters of it. So for oak tree or other types of trees of similar, um, there's a variety of techniques you can use. You can build the armatures out of rope or wire. Uh, it takes a long time, but they look great. Uh, I like sagebrush branch armatures. Um, you can buy these or collect these and trim them to the shape and using super tree material for the foliage. Uh, after you've glued the foliage onto your armature, you want to make sure you spray paint it to seal it if you're going to dip it in water-based glue. Otherwise, the tree will fall apart in the glue. And don't ask how I know that. Uh, here's Okie Dokie Oaks. This was sort of state of the art for California oak trees from you know, the 80s through the 90s and early 2000s. The gentleman who ran this company passed away a number of years ago, um, but the trees are still available here and there. This uses a rope armature covered with a sort of a, a gel. Um, here is a super tree armature, um, or excuse me, not a super tree, a uh, sagebrush armature, and I put crushed up super trees on it. That was sort of a test, and then we went to actually building them from scratch with the super tree material glued on. And then it's been flocked. And then there's the kind of scene you can end up with with the trees that you create. So for small fir trees, conical firs, um, you can actually purchase these and not do too badly. There's a lot of eBay sellers and other places. You can use furnace filter or you can use a bottle brush technique. You can look on the web to, to look at these techniques. The trees you're seeing in this scene were used, uh, were built doing the bottle brush method by Rod Jensen. Um, for larger pine trees out in the west, and particularly things get very tall, 150 feet or more for ponderosa, white fir, and cedar. If you're doing redwoods or even taller, 
So that means we have to deal with the trunks. Uh, um, a lot of these trees have, you know, 50 feet of exposed trunks. So um, I generally recommend finding sticks in the forest that are pretty straight. They don't have to be perfectly straight because trees actually are not perfectly straight in nature. You can use dowels. Um, you have to figure out a way to paint and texture them and a way to put some dead limbs on the bottom of them. Um, you, one thing you can do is you can use broom, uh, broomstick straw and uh, cut it up. It'll work well. For, uh, the foliage, probably filter stars is the best way to go there, the, the furnace filter technique. So here's a quick tour through available pine trees, if you will, larger trees. This is an old uh, Woodland Scenics uh, kit, this white metal armature that you bend and then apply foam to. Looks pretty good. Here's a boutique tree that was bought. This looks great, but can't afford them in quantity. Uh, here's an example of a furnace filter tree, a small one. This didn't take very long to make it and looks, looks great in the background. <clears throat> Here we have larger furnace filter trees. These took a lot longer to make, but they, they look pretty good, I think. Here's an example of the trees, which is the armature, as you can kind of see the furnace filter material before it's been painted. I notice how the tall trees change the, the scene in terms of how the terrain relates to the height. Uh, there's one that's been sort of painted and ready for flock. So super detailed trees, there's a couple of ways you can go here. I only built a few of these because they took forever. Russ Larson wrote a, um, uh, an article in RMC in 2006 on how to do glue limbs. And basically you take twine and, and glue it and then make build limbs out of it and then attach it to the trunk. That's what these trees are. They look great. They took forever to make. Or you can buy pre-made limbs. These are twisted wire with foliage that's been attached that you put on the trunk. And uh, those also look very good. So working with trees, a few tips for you here. Um, I'm a big fan of clothespins. They're a very handy tool. I have several hundred of them in the layout room right now. We'll talk a little bit more about how to use them in a second. Finding the good side of the tree. Um, you know, if you've spent a fair amount of time building a tree, then you want to hold it up and angle it and then mark it so that you know the front, the best side. So when you go to put it down on the scenery, its best side is forward. Uh, also, when you're dealing with super trees, oftentimes they're curved and there's a way you can hold the tree so you can't really see the curve. And so you want to be aware of that when you install it. Use only the best materials up front, and everybody will assume that all the way in the back they look great too, or they just won't be able to see it. For installation, I like to use crazy glue, and the idea here is that you dribble some medium crazy glue on the base of the trunk of the tree, and then you hit it with accelerant, and it's done. Uh, you don't have to wait for the glue to dry. You don't have to drill any holes, and if you don't like the placement of the tree, you can just crack it off and uh, put it back down again. And we'll talk a little bit about how to store trees as well. So here's with the uh, clothespins, and uh, these are clothespin tripods, basically, uh, and you can use these to sort of set the trees up to mock them up, and I use these all over the layout. I've even used them on layout tours where I'll have a bunch of trees with the clothespins standing up, and then I'll put uh, a bunch of bushes in front of them, and nobody knows uh, that they're there. Here's another example, a little different approach here. Here's where you just clamp the tree trunk here, and then you just add enough ballast to the tree will stand up. You can also see the detail with the smaller branches here in the bottom of the trunks. In this particular one, this is kind of a bunch of things going on in this uh, particular picture. Here I've, I've graded the trees. Yeah, it's over the top. I made about 80 of these in the first batch. Um, and then I also have marked them so that I can tell where the good side is when I go to install them. And then the other thing here is for larger trees, in order to work with them, you're going to want to have some way of holding on to them and keeping them standing up. So in this particular case, I drilled uh, holes in and put toothpicks in them for pins so that they could stand up that way. Um, for super trees, storing them is much easier to just sort of poke them into styrofoam. You can get away with that. I had probably eight or ten boxes stored on the layouts for a number of years of super trees stored like this. And there's another example of the uh, larger trees in storage um, while I'm working on them. So a few tips here real quick. Um, you know, I am a, uh, an operator, and uh, so I wanted these big trees in the scene in the foreground where they look for layout tours and for photography because I thought they looked great. <laughs> But uh, they're kind of hard to work with if you're trying to operate on the layout, so I wanted them removable. This is 14-gauge wire that's drilled in the bottom of this tree, and then there's blocks glued to the bottom of the layout and holes drilled. Uh, and the wire is flexible, so when you put the tree in, if it's sitting at a funny angle, you can adjust the height. And I have another set of blocks and holes in another part of the layout, and I move the trees out of the way to that other part of the layout and install them there out of the way for operating sessions. 
Another classic uh, scenery trick that people like to use is uh, sort of using hiding the land's end here. This was the yard we were looking at earlier, and you notice that I've sort of rolled the scenery off this direction, kind of will go down to a creek here. Um, and when I was going to, then I'm going to fill this full of trees. And when you paint the backdrop, you want to paint in, think about where the trees are going to go in front of the backdrop, and then paint the same color as the trees so that when you look at it, if there's any gaps in the trees, you won't see the gaps that'll fill in. That's what it looks like. And that's what happened to the nine boxes of super trees stored under the layout. And at that point, I was out of super trees. Um, and then mocking it up, I'm also a big fan of mocking stuff up. I'm sure you all do this. I'll even take the dirt and lay it out and put the rocks and everything there to kind of see how things look. Um, you can mess around with stuff. Here, I'm trying to figure out tree placement in a scene and the rock placement. Um, so after messing around with it, that's what the scene ended up looking like after the mock-up. Uh, here's another example. Uh, in this particular case, I wanted to be able to reach in, and so I was futzing with things, standing back and looking at it, uh, trying to get the way I wanted it, and that's how it ended up looking in the end. And then sometimes you're in a spot where you just want to make something go away. <laughs> this corner over here, everybody, every layout's got something like this. Um, and so We'll go with your typical mountain that sort of rises up out of nowhere. Um, but I figured, well, you know, I don't really need to do a tunnel portal here. We'll just see if we can hide that. And the trick will be to try and make this look a little softer and a little more realistic. So it's trees to the rescue. You notice over here you can't really see the gap at all there. Uh, the mine still kind of knows it's there, but it's not sure what's there. And from the aisle, you can't see that at all. And we've softened the edge here a little bit with the plants. And then just a couple others here, and I'm done. Um, so I like to keep things as true and as level as I possibly can. So I actually will put uh, the level on the layout. If I can get it on the building, I'll lay it there. Uh, if it won't go on the building, if I can't reach it, then I'll true it up uh, somewhere else and then use it as a site across to the building to make sure that it's level. Um, and another tip, I'm sure many of you have done this, is using cell phones, uh, or you can even lay your SLR on the layout uh, to take pictures, and you can check your scenery that way. If you're using an iPhone or a similar device, be aware that the, the camera is on one side of the phone, so it'll give you two views depending on how you lay the camera on the layout. Um, and that one sort of lets me know that things are true and, and lined up. And that's all I've got. I want to thank you guys for hanging out. Any questions? Okay, uh, Robin has got some questions, I think, and then my apologies. Uh, we've got some questions, I think, for Dean's presentation as well. So let's spend a few minutes uh, dealing with some of the questions. Yeah, thank you, guys. Hopefully, you can hear me. Yes. Uh, yep. Great. So, so thanks, guys. That was great. Um, uh, so I, I have saw a couple of questions, actually three questions for you, Guy, and then I have a couple okay. of questions for Dean from the previous one. So uh, Mark Rocha from Nuremberg in Germany. He's an SN3 guy in Germany, which is lovely. Um, he was asking, how do you preserve those natural materials like the rotting twigs so that they don't continue to rot or decompose or put unwanted critters on your layout? Um, I haven't had too much. That's a question that comes up, you know, as, are we going to have mold and bugs and other stuff invading the room? A couple of comments. First of all, um, the local guys that I learned this technique from have been doing this for approximately 30 years or more, and we haven't really had any problems with it. Um, the other thing is many of the items get glued down to the point where they're just smothered in glue. So anything that was alive is long gone. Um, and as far as the rotten uh, twigs and stuff, if they're pretty dry, I don't seem to have any trouble with them decaying or, or further eroding. Okay, thank you. And then um, one other question, well actually maybe two other questions. Um, have you used the McKenzie method perhaps for background trees? Uh, I have not, I have not checked that out. Um, you got me there, so yeah. <laughs> okay. I'm not familiar. Okay, and the final one I had here, someone said, has anyone, uh, Andrew McDonald said, has anyone tried using 3D printed trunks? Uh, not 3D printed, although um, uh, Bragdon for a while sold a bunch of, of resin trunks that were highly detailed um, that I've not been able to get my hands on, but I've seen them on other layouts. Um, 3D printing would be a very interesting thing, particularly for the tall trees. Um, that's a very good idea. Okay. Um, and Pete, um, our host, he, um, this is kind of a, a an, I'm not quite sure, I, I must have missed this part. He says, um, please expand on the coconut husks. 
Oh yeah, okay. So so basically, that's the they they call it furnace filter, which is a bit of a misnomer because furnace filters are like fiberglass, right? This is stuff that's sold at Walmart, and basically what it is is a big green pad about two feet by maybe three foot, and it's about an inch thick, and it's green, and you put it you'd put it in coolers and various other things, and it's sort of a do-it-yourself kind of a cooler thing, um, and you cut it up into small. Uh, little rings and then you put those on shish kebab style on your tree trunk in order to create a tree uh, and then you'll attack it uh, cut it in various ways there's several very good videos on how to do that on youtube okay and then um one more from mark Vache in um, mm -hmm. dallas um uh, he said please ask guy if he has experienced a variance in the various static grass materials as to how easy are they are to stick. So I think he's looking at, is there a difference between the different vendors' materials and whether they stick equally well? Uh, I really haven't had too much uh, um, pro or different. I haven't noticed that many differences. To me, the big difference is the height of the grass, right? The old uh, two millimeter stuff that Scenic Express or not Scenic was Woodland Scenic sold for years. That stuff didn't really stand up very much. Some of the more modern stuff you get to the four and the six millimeter. It's much easier to stand up. The other thing that I've noticed is that if you don't soak the area with glue enough, sometimes it won't adhere or it'll be hard to get the grass to stick. And uh, and then the other thing is that the the strength of your grass gun uh, um, you know I have one that'll zap spiders at 30 feet so it definitely <laughs> and the grass stands up it'll move when you move it across <laughs> oh, that's how that's how you get rid of the critters that come from yeah sticks, exactly right? yeah, okay. <laughs> I understand that okay um, so those are the questions for you guys so thank you I, if I've right. missed any I apologize but I was been trying to keep an eye on them so thank you so much for lovely presentations well so, thank um, you guys for hanging out and for making this possible I appreciate that